Hi, I'm Dr. Ted Delbridge, Executive Director of MEMS. It certainly has been a trying year, yet despite managing a pandemic and all the things that we've done in the meantime, we've managed to update the Maryland EMS protocols for EMS clinicians. We hope that you find the changes that we've made significant and making them easier to reference and more compact and useful for EMS clinicians in the field. We recognize the one thing we ask of you that you can never get back is your personal time. And so in advance, thank you for taking time out to review this year's protocol updates and know that we are on a journey to continuously make them better. Thank you for everything you do every single day. Hello, and welcome to the 2021 Maryland EMS protocol update. I'm Dr. Tim Chismar, Maryland State EMS Medical Director. I'd like to start by taking a moment to say thank you to all of our EMS clinicians for your continued commitment to exceptional patient care during the COVID-19 pandemic. The challenges have been all too real. For a long time spent in personal protective equipment, staying apart from family members while in quarantine, and coping with the loss of family members and coworkers. In addition to this, Maryland's EMS community continues to step up to provide vaccines in our communities during the COVID-19 pandemic. So on behalf of all Marylanders, thank you. We hope that you will enjoy a new look and format to the Maryland EMS protocols this year, what I have dubbed Protocol 2.0. Based on feedback from across the state, we've re redesigned the protocols with a few goals in mind. First, to give you, our EMS clinicians, a succinct, evidence-based medical protocol to provide high-quality care to our patients. This streamlined protocol limits repetition. It focuses on just what you need to know when taking care of patients in their living room or in the back of the ambulance. In addition to removing redundant material, we've made the protocols easier to access the information you need in rapid fashion. Protocol topic areas are color-coded for quick reference. The ALS, BLS, and medical consult sections are clearly delineated in boxes and are color-coded as well. And if you're using an electronic version of the protocol document, you may click on any medication name or link protocol in italics, and you'll be able to easily access related information. Finally, you should know that our protocols reflect best practices from the scientific literature, national EMS scope of practice, and national model clinical guidelines. Together with our protocol review committee, I will continue to evaluate these sources and modify our protocols accordingly. During this update, you will learn about content changes this year in the areas of agitation, stroke, respiratory care, and burn management, just to name a few. You should also be aware that we have changed the Epinephrine Concentration Convention to meet FDA standards. What was previously known as Epinephrine 1 to 1,000 will now be referred to as Epinephrine 1 milligram per ml. And what was known as epinephrine 1 to 10,000 is now epinephrine 0 0.1 milligrams per ml. These revisions were required to prevent medication errors related to strength being expressed as a ratio instead of concentration in milligrams per ml. Finally, please take a few minutes to familiarize yourself with the new protocol 2.0. I hope you will find the new layout gives you faster access to the information you need during a call. Also, please take a moment to take care of yourself. If you need support, reach out to your peers, department resources, or visit the Maryland COVID-19 Crisis Support Program for support services at no cost. In closing, I'm proud to be part of the Maryland EMS system, and I hope that you are as well. Thank you for taking time to learn about our new protocols. Please be safe, take care of yourselves, each other, and our patients. While the new format of the protocols in 2021 is the most obvious change, there have been several other changes to the patient care standards this year. One such change involves the addition of distinct protocols for the treatment of both adult and pediatric hypo and hyperglycemia. Previously, guidance was dispersed through multiple treatment and procedure protocols. For BLS clinicians, the use of a glucometer to check blood glucose levels has been changed from an optional protocol to a statewide standard. Jurisdictions will implement this change as they are able to purchase new equipment, but glucometers are expected to be available to BLS clinicians no later than July of 2022. Based upon blood glucose levels, 
as determined by the use of the glucometer by both ALS and BLS clinicians, there are now distinct treatment regimens that address those findings. The indications for the implementation of this protocol include, but are not limited to, a blood glucose level less than 70 mg per deciliter or one that is 300 mg per deciliter or greater, patient reported high or low blood glucose, diabetic patients with other medical symptoms such as vomiting, or patients with an altered mental status or found unconscious. You should be sure to review this new protocol to recognize all the listed indications. For BLS treatment, your first step should be to check the blood glucose level using the glucometer. If you find the level to be below 70 mg per deciliter, you should administer 10 to 15 grams of glucose paste between the patient's gum and cheek. If, after 10 minutes, the patient has not improved, you should administer an additional dose of 10 to 15 grams of glucose paste. For ALS clinicians, once you have determined the adult patient's blood glucose levels, your treatment will be based upon your findings. If the patient's blood glucose is less than 70 milligrams per deciliter, you administer 10% dextrose in 50 milliliter boluses, one minute apart, to a maximum of 250 milliliters or 25 grams of 50% dextrose IV push until the patient has a return to a normal mental status and the patient's blood glucose is at least 90 milligrams per deciliter. However, if the adult patient has persistently altered mental status and blood glucose that is below 90 milligrams per deciliter despite treatment, repeat this dosing regimen. If the hypoglycemic patient is less than 28 days old and has a blood glucose level less than 40 milligrams per deciliter, you administer 2 milliliters per kilogram of 10% dextrose IV or IO, rechecking the blood glucose level after the first dose. Medical consultation is required for a second dose of 10% dextrose IV or IO. For patients who are greater than 28 days old, but have not yet reached their 18th birthday, with a blood glucose level below 70 milligrams per deciliter, administer two to four milliliters per kilogram of 10% dextrose IV or IO to a maximum of 25 grams, rechecking glucose levels after the first dose. Medical direction is required prior to the administration of a second dose. If during your treatment of hypoglycemic patients, you are unable to initiate an IV and the patient has a blood glucose less than 70 mg per deciliter. Administer glucagon, 1 mg, intramuscular or intranasal. The dose, however, is decreased to 0.5 mg of glucagon if the patient is between 28 days old through 4 years of age. Following the glucagon administration, if the patient continues to have an altered mental status, and the blood glucose remains below 90 mg per deciliter after 15 minutes, transport to the hospital should not be delayed. In the event that an ALS clinician finds the patient's blood glucose to be 300 mg per deciliter or greater, you should administer 10 milliliters per kilogram lactated ringers bolus unless the patient has rails, wheezing, pedal edema, or a history of renal failure, or CHF is present. You respond on a BLS unit to the report of a patient with a decreased level of consciousness. Upon arrival, you find a 34-year-old male unconscious with a pulse of 100 and a respiratory rate of 14. He is wearing a medical alert bracelet that identifies a history of diabetes. Family members on the scene report that the patient has had a stomach virus for two days causing vomiting and diarrhea, yet the patient has continued his normal insulin doses. You check the patient's blood glucose and you note a reading of 38 milligrams per deciliter. The appropriate treatment regimen for a BLS provider would be administer 10 to 15 grams of glucose paste between the patient's gum and cheek, administering an additional dose of 10 to 15 grams of glucose paste if not improved after 10 minutes. Transfer care to the ALS unit if available and transport is not delayed. Administer 100 to 150 milligrams of glucose paste 
between the patient's gum and cheek, administering an additional dose of 500 milligrams of glucose paste if not improved in 20 minutes. That's right. The correct dose for this patient is 10 to 15 grams of glucose paste between the patient's gum and cheek. It is no secret that the treatment of suspected stroke patients has been continually evolving over the past several years. This year's protocols reflect the evidence-based changes following the Baltimore City LAMS research protocol success last year. Because of this success, which is reinforced by scientific data, the criteria used for the study is now our statewide treatment standard. While I will go through the protocol briefly here, it is imperative that you take the time to review and learn what is expected of you as you treat these stroke patients. The indications of a suspected stroke beyond numbness or weakness that is often on only one side may also include blurred vision, which may have resolved prior to your arrival, difficulty speaking, sudden onset of dizziness or loss of balance, and a severe unexplained headache. When your patient assessment reveals any of these symptoms, you should start down the treatment outlined in the stroke protocol. First, position your patient with their head elevated at 30 degrees. Check their blood sugar levels with the glucometer. If their blood sugar is below 70 milligrams per deciliter, treat according to the hypoglycemia protocol. If the patient is under 18 years of age, Provide them with oxygen at 2 to 6 liters per minute via nasal cannula unless they are hypoxic or in respiratory distress. For adult patients, provide oxygen only if the patient's pulse ox is less than 94%. Assess the patient using the Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale. If there is any abnormality noted when assessing facial droop, arm drift, or speech, consider this a positive sign for stroke. You would also want to perform a posterior cerebellar assessment for any abnormality in balance or vision. If you discover abnormal findings on either the Cincinnati or posterior cerebellar assessment, consider the possibility of a large vessel occlusion stroke and calculate the patient's Los Angeles motor scale score in relation to facial droop, arm drift, and grip strength. This LAMS score will be important when determining where to transport the patient. For a LAMS score of 0 to 3, transport the patient to the closest designated acute stroke ready primary or comprehensive stroke center. For a LAMS score of 4 or greater, transport to the closest comprehensive stroke center or thrombectomy capable primary stroke center. If the patient cannot be delivered to the center within 30 minutes, go to the closest designated acute stroke ready or primary stroke center. Importantly, use of aviation will not generally be able to deliver a patient to one of these centers within 30 minutes. If a suspected stroke patient is greater than 30 minutes from any stroke center, transport to the closest hospital or request aviation if there would be a time savings. Pediatric patients with suspected stroke those who have not reached their 18th birthday, consult local base station and pediatric base station to arrange transport to a pediatric trauma center. It is also important that you obtain and document a phone number for one or more individuals who have knowledge of the patient's presenting symptoms, last known well time, and medical history. This information must be communicated to the receiving hospital staff. ALS care for the suspected stroke patient should include the establishment of IV access, preferably on the unaffected side of the body, and obtaining blood samples. Consult for all suspected stroke patients as soon as possible. You should use the verbiage, Priority 1, Stroke Alert Patient with a last known well time of, insert time. If the patient is hypotensive, obtain medical consultation. However, do not treat hypertension with medications in the field. You are on the scene with a 74-year-old female patient who is experiencing sudden onset right side hemiparesis, facial droop, and a new inability to speak. The patient was last seen well 10 hours ago. The patient has a LAM score of 5. You are 10 minutes from a primary stroke center and 25 minutes from the closest comprehensive stroke center. According to the 2021 Stroke Protocol, 
Where should you transport this patient? Primary stroke center. Comprehensive stroke center. That's correct. This patient should be transported to the comprehensive stroke center 25 minutes away. You have the same patient as in question number one, but now you are 10 minutes from the primary stroke and 45 minutes from the closest comprehensive or thrombectomy capable primary stroke center. According to the 2021 stroke protocol, which of the following methods should be used to transport the patient? Use aviation to transport to the more distant comprehensive or thrombectomy capable primary stroke center. Transport by ground to the primary stroke center. Aviation will not likely be able to deliver the patient to the more distant center within 30 minutes. Certain patients are eligible for the clot-busting medication, called TPA, and longer transport times could put some patients outside of the time window for this medication. You have the same patient as in question number one, but you are 40 minutes from any stroke center. Aviation is available to transport the patient if needed and could deliver the patient to a stroke center within 30 minutes. Which of the following methods should be used to transport the patient? Transport to the closest local hospital, ETA 40 minutes. Aviation for transport, ETA 30 minutes. Aviation would result in a time savings and you are more than 30 minutes from any stroke center. A would be the correct answer if aviation were not able to transport the patient within a shorter period of time than ground transport. Although the treatment and transport of patients suffering from snake bites in Maryland are somewhat rare, we do respond to these calls on occasion. It is helpful to refresh our memory on appropriate management for these patients. While the protocol changes this year were minor, they do bring two changes in the treatment that you will provide as EMS clinicians. The first of these changes is that you will no longer apply ice packs to a snake bite injury. The second change is that you should not attempt to capture the snake or transport it to the hospital. Instead of bringing the snake, simply attempt to take a picture of the snake and bring that with the patient if it can be done safely. In order to show you how this all fits together, allow me to run through the content of the protocol. When you begin assessing the patient, look for indications like localized pain, puncture wounds, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, altered mental status, or hypoperfusion. Once again, it is important that you review the protocol in its entirety so you'll be able to recognize the indications of a snake bite and a reaction. Beginning with the BLS care for a snake bite patient with moderate to severe allergic reaction symptoms or mild symptoms with a history of life-threatening allergic reactions to a prior snake bite. Consider epinephrine, one milligram per milliliter, given IM or using an auto-injector. The dose for ages five and older is 0.5 milligrams IM or using an auto-injector for adults while the dose for a child less than five years old is 0.15 milligrams IM or a pediatric auto-injector. You may also consider the administration of albuterol, 2.5 milligrams nebulized or through a multi-dose inhaler, two puffs inhaled, as long as the patient is over two years old. If the patient is under two, the albuterol dose is 1.25 milligrams nebulized or two puffs inhaled from the MDI. Remember to remove all jewelry on the affected extremity and immobilize that extremity as soon as possible. You should take a picture of the snake if possible, but do not attempt to capture or transport it to the hospital. When treating a poisonous snake bite, do not apply distal or proximal constricting bands, apply ice packs, locally incise the bite, copiously wash the wound, or attempt to remove the venom by sucking or suctioning. While this may look good in old movies, sucking on a snake wound is clearly a no-no in regards to the protocol. ALS clinicians, beyond the BLS treatment already described, should establish IV access and give a 20 milliliter per kilogram bolus of lactated ringers, if indicated, in the uninjured extremity. 
titrate to a systolic blood pressure of 90 millimeters of mercury for adults or age-appropriate blood pressure for pediatric patients. You respond to an injured person at a single-family home in the countryside. Upon arrival, you find a 63-year-old male patient sitting on his patio and holding his hand in pain. His wife, on the scene, explains that he was cleaning the ivy off the side of the house and was bit by a copperhead on his hand. Assessment reveals that the patient has two puncture wounds to his hand with profound swelling and tingling in his fingertips. The patient complains of nausea. He appears pale and diaphoretic. His vital signs are a blood pressure of 80 by palp, a pulse rate of 120, and a respiratory rate of 26. Based upon the new snake bite protocol, the correct management for this patient would be administer 20 milliliters per kilogram lactated ringers, immobilize the affected extremity, and take a picture of the snake if possible. Administer 10 milliliters per kilogram of lactated ringers and apply cool packs to the injured area. That's right, the patient is hypotensive and tachycardic and should receive lactated ringers, 20 milliliters per kilogram IV, and have the affected extremity immobilized. The appropriate treatment of a patient, whether adult or pediatric, suffering from agitation can be challenging and may be anxiety-provoking for the EMS clinician. The goal is to reduce the patient's agitation and get them the help that they need. Patients experiencing agitation are stratified into mild, moderate, and severe symptomology for the purposes of determining the most appropriate treatment. According to the 2021 protocols, mild agitation is indicated by a patient that is agitated but cooperative and making rational decisions. There is no immediate concern for patient or clinician safety. Moderate agitation is indicated by a patient who is irrational and exhibiting behavior that puts themselves or clinicians at risk. Severe agitation symptoms are demonstrated by a patient who is physically violent and presents an immediate and imminent threat to themselves or others. The BLS treatment for agitation revolves around safety and causation. EMS clinicians should maintain scene safety and have a low threshold for the requesting additional resources, including law enforcement when dealing with an agitated patient. Attempt to decrease external stimuli by speaking calmly with the patient at their level in a quiet environment if possible. Look at the patient and assess their capacity and risk for self-harm. Consider the causes of the agitation, such as medical emergency, head trauma, psychiatric disturbance, or drug or alcohol ingestion. For a patient experiencing mild agitation, the EMS clinician should attempt to verbally de-escalate the situation and provide emotional support using the SAFER model. Stabilize the situation by containing and lowering the stimuli. Assess and acknowledge the crisis. Facilitate the identification and activation of resources, such as a chaplain, family, friends, or police. Encourage the patient to use resources and take actions in their best interest. Act to ensure recovery or referral by leaving the patient in the care of a responsible person or professional or transport the patient to receive needed care. ALS clinicians should begin to consider the appropriate pharmacologic intervention in patients that are exhibiting moderate or severe agitation. Our goal is to ensure we get the patients to the care they need with the minimal medication or by the least restrictive means. As a reminder, ALS clinicians should not feel compelled to administer medications if the patient is amenable to verbal reassurance, redirection, and de-escalation. In the case of moderate agitation, ALS clinicians should first evaluate for the source of the agitation and treat accordingly. For cases of suspected medical delirium, such as in cases of infection, the adult patient can be treated with haloperidol 5 mg IM. This dose should be reduced to 2.5 mg if the patient is 69 years of age or older. In cases of suspected psychiatric emergency leading to agitation, such as schizophrenia or a patient who has not taken prescribed medications, 
the adult patient again can be treated with haloperidol 5 mg IM. This dose should be reduced to 2.5 mg if the patient is 69 years of age or older. If the source of agitation is suspected to be related to drug or alcohol ingestion, head injury, or other unknown causes, then the pharmacologic approach would be midazolam, 5 mg IV or IM. As with haloperidol, the midazolam dose should be reduced to 2.5 mg if the patient is 69 years of age or older. When treating pediatric patients with moderate agitation, the pharmacologic approach is primarily age-based. For a patient who is under 5 years old, there are no medications indicated for the treatment of moderate agitation. Generally, medications are not required in this age group. If the pediatric moderate agitation patient is between the ages of 5 and 12 years, you should consider administering haloperidol at a dose of 0.05 mg per kilogram given IM up to a maximum dose of 2.5 mg. For patients 13 to 18 years of age with moderate agitation, you should consider haloperidol at a dose of 2.5 to 5 mg IM. The ALS treatment of severe agitation often involves the need to rapidly move to a pharmacologic response because of the inherent threat to patient, bystander, and clinician safety. When dealing with a patient having severe agitation, consider midazolam, 5 mg given either IM or IV, reducing the dose to 2.5 mg if the patient is 69 years of age or older. Ketamine. 1 mg per kilogram given either IV or IO to a maximum dose of 100 mg or ketamine 4 mg per kilogram given IM to a maximum dose of 400 mg if there is immediate and imminent danger to patient or EMS. Medical consultation must be obtained prior to ketamine administration However, it may be given without consultation if there is immediate and imminent danger to the patients or clinicians. If the severe agitation patient is between the ages of 13 and 18 years of age, administer ketamine 1 mg per kilogram given either IV or IO to a maximum dose of 100 mg or ketamine 4 mg per kilogram given IM to a maximum dose of 400 mg if there is immediate and imminent danger to patient or EMS. Medical consultation must be obtained prior to ketamine administration. However, it may be given without consultation if there is immediate and imminent danger to the patient or clinicians. If the severe agitation patient is less than 13 years of age, the ketamine dose is the same, however, you must first obtain medical consultation in all cases. Following sedation, you should initiate cardiac monitoring, continuous end tidal CO2 monitoring, and the monitoring of pulse oximetry. Obtain a 12-lead EKG to evaluate for a prolonged QTC. Evaluate the patient for any signs of trauma. Check the patient's blood glucose. Check the patient's body temperature and initiate passive cooling measures as appropriate. If the patient is tachycardic or hyperthermic, initiate a 20 milliliter per kilogram fluid bolus of lactated ringers. Apply physical restraints as indicated in the physical restraints protocol only if needed to ensure safe transport. There are some important items that must be emphasized in the ALS treatment of agitation. Any additional doses beyond the first dose of haloperidol, ketamine, or midazolam require medical consultation. Diphenhydramine, 25 to 50 mg given IM or IV, may be administered if a dystonic reaction occurs with the administration of haloperidol. The use of ketamine should be avoided, if at all possible, in the agitated elderly patient due to the risk for over-sedation and apnea. Have advanced airway equipment, bag valve mask, oxygen, and suction immediately available at all times for patients receiving ketamine. 
all patients who receive ketamine must be transported in a supine position with at least two clinicians in the patient care area, one of which must be an ALS clinician. Patients experiencing severe agitation should not receive haloperidol or diphenhydramine for sedation as this may worsen an anticholinergic crisis. Remember that haloperidol may prolong the QTC interval, which increases the risk of cardiac dysrhythmia. Haloperidol may also increase the risk of seizures. It is imperative that the known risks of giving a patient ketamine are weighed against the potential patient benefit in making a patient care decision. EMS may not accept requests from law enforcement officers to administer ketamine under any circumstances. Online medical direction must be obtained for midazolam dosing if a prior dose of ketamine was administered to the patient. You respond to a report of a suicidal person in front of a local diner. You arrive to find an adult male, who appears to be in his mid-twenties, in front of the restaurant screaming that he is going to kill anyone who gets close to him. He is physically punching and breaking windshields of cars in the parking lot with no apparent pain response. He is obviously suffering from severe agitation and is posing an immediate threat to himself and EMS on the scene. You make the decision that the administration of ketamine IM would be appropriate for this patient. The patient appears to be 90 kilograms. What is the correct dose? 180 milligrams given IM. 360 milligrams given IM. That's correct. The correct dose of ketamine in this case is 4 milligrams per kilogram for a dose of 360 milligrams given IM since there is an immediate and imminent danger to patient and EMS. Importantly, the patient must have close cardiac and respiratory monitoring initiated as soon as possible after ketamine has been administered. When making the decision to administer ketamine to a severely agitated patient, as described in this scenario involving the adult male in the diner parking lot, is medical consultation required before giving the ketamine? Normally it would be, but a single dose of ketamine can be given without consultation in cases of imminent and immediate danger to the patient and EMS. Consultation is always required prior to the administration of ketamine. That's correct! The patient may be administered a single dose of ketamine without medical consultation, as he presents an imminent and immediate danger to himself and EMS. In any other scenario, medical consultation would be required before administering ketamine. This change to the protocols is not ALS in nature, but it is important that you, as an ALS clinician in Maryland, recognize a change to the protocols for BLS clinicians. Previously, BLS clinicians were able to provide albuterol treatments using patient-prescribed handheld aerosol inhalers, where the clinicians would assist the patient in taking two doses of two puffs per dose for a total of four puffs. Beginning on July 1st, however, BLS clinicians will have the option of using the previously allowable aerosol inhalers or administering 2.5 milligrams of albuterol using a sterile unit dose administered with a nebulizer. While this was previously an ALS skill in Maryland, allowing BLS clinicians the ability to treat patients with a nebulizer is medically prudent and brings our protocols in line with existing national standards. BLS will not administer ipratropium or Atrovent. This remains an ALS-only medication. Of note, this change will occur gradually over the next year as EMS operational programs provide training and equipment to BLS clinicians. Based upon the American Burn Association's updated guidelines and with significant input from the burn centers, there have been some changes to the ALS care of burns by EMS clinicians. Specifically, the updates to the protocol will limit IV fluid administration to those with shock and those with burns over 20% body surface area. So let's take a look at the ALS protocol. 
The treatment prescribed in the protocol at the BLS level is unchanged, though you should make sure you review the new formatting of the protocol as it makes it much easier to follow. At the ALS level, the protocol stresses the need to assess and reassess the patient's airway, being ever cognizant of signs of respiratory failure. Then you can establish IV access as appropriate. With the 2021 protocol, fluid resuscitation is not indicated for superficial burns or for deeper burns under 20% body surface area. For visibly large burns that are predicted to be 20% body surface area or greater, administer lactated ringers. To patients 15 years of age and older, at a rate of 500 milliliters per hour, which is 120 drops per minute using a 15 drop set, the maximum dose is 2,000 milliliters without medical consultation. For children who have not reached their 15th birthday, do not administer IV fluids unless the patient is in shock. For patients who are found to be in shock, for adults, administer small fluid boluses of lactated ringers with a maximum single bolus of 250 milliliters prior to blood pressure check to achieve and maintain a systolic blood pressure of 90 or greater or a mean arterial pressure of 65. If a head injury is also suspected, Administer small boluses of lactated ringers to maintain a systolic blood pressure of 110 or greater. Pediatric burn patients who are in shock should receive small fluid boluses IV to achieve and maintain a systolic blood pressure of 70 plus two times the patient's age in years. For example, a minimum acceptable blood pressure for a two-year-old would be 74. If your transport time is greater than 30 minutes, consult for determination of a fluid maintenance dose. Remember to take care of the entire patient, recognizing the pain that often accompanies the injury, and administer an opioid for pain control as allowed in the pain management protocol. You are treating a conscious and alert 18-year-old male patient who was burned after a motor vehicle collision involving fire. You have estimated that the patient has moderate to full thickness burns over 36% of his body surface area, but no apparent respiratory involvement. The patient currently has a blood pressure of 114 over 72, a pulse of 110, and a respiratory rate of 22. No signs of respiratory distress are evident. You are within 15 minutes of the closest burn center and will be transporting by land. What is your fluid resuscitation plan for this patient according to the 2021 burn protocols? Establish an IV and administer lactated ringers at a rate of 500 milliliters per hour to a maximum dose of 2,000 milliliters without medical consultation. Establish an IV and administer small fluid boluses of lactated ringers up to 250 milliliters prior to blood pressure check. That is correct. This patient meets the fluid resuscitation criteria for burns having greater than 20% BSA involved. However, the patient does not currently appear to be in shock and the fluid boluses are not indicated. The ST Elevation Myocardial Infarction Protocol that goes into effect in 2021 is an ALS-only protocol that provides guidance on the appropriate categorization and treatment of patients having an apparent STEMI. We have simplified the EKG criteria for STEMI this year. The indications, as outlined in the protocol, are patients with acute coronary syndrome symptoms, including angina or anginal equivalents, such as shortness of breath, chest epigastric, arm or jaw pain or discomfort, diaphoresis, and or nausea, and meets one of the following criteria on diagnostic quality EKG. New ST elevation of one millimeter or greater in two or more contiguous leads or posterior MI presented as ST depression greater than one millimeter in V1 through V3. Beyond the aspirin, nitroglycerin, and pain management protocols, the STEMI protocol specifies that STEMI patients are priority one and require the transmission of an EKG and medical consultation 
with clear communications of an incoming STEMI alert. Recall that STEMI patients only need supplemental oxygen if their pulse ox is less than 94%. Do not give oxygen routinely. A right-sided or posterior EKG may still be performed as indicated. STEMI patients, per the protocol, shall be transported to the closest cardiac interventional center by air or ground as long as the delivery time is not more than 45 minutes greater than transport to the nearest emergency department. Once delivered to the hospital, STEMI patients may bypass the ED and go directly to the cardiac catheterization lab as directed by the receiving ED physician. If the patient cannot be delivered to a cardiac interventional center within the allotted time, complete the fibrinolytic therapy checklist for STEMI. If the patient meets all the criteria for fibrinolytic therapy, transport to the closest ED. If the patient does not meet all of the criteria for fibrinolytic therapy, consult with the nearest cardiac interventional center and the closest ED to determine the most appropriate receiving facility. If the patient is suffering an inferior MI, obtain a right-sided EKG, V4R, to evaluate for right ventricular involvement. If ST elevation is noted in V4R, do not give nitrates due to the risk of hypotension. If the patient is hypotensive with clear lung sounds, administer lactated ringers, 250 to 500 milliliters IV. Be sure, however, to obtain medical direction before giving a dose greater than 500 milliliters. If the patient does not have ST elevations greater than one millimeter in two contiguous leads on the 12 lead EKG, the patient shall be transported to the closest appropriate emergency department. In the event that the patient's EKG shows a left bundle branch block or paced rhythm plus any of the following, consultation with the closest appropriate EMS base station or cardiac interventional center is required. Cardiogenic shock, excessive ST segment elevation greater than 5 millimeters, or ST segment deviation, whether elevation or depression, in the same direction as the QRS complex. Other high-risk EKG findings that require consultation with EMS base station or cardiac interventional center include Wellens wave, a biphasic T wave, or deeply inverted T wave in the precordial leads, ST segment elevation in AVR with coexisting multi-lead ST segment depression, or hyperacute T waves shown as peaked broad-based T waves. For any STEMI patient who has not reached their 18th birthday, consult a pediatric base station for management and destination. You are treating a 57-year-old male patient who is complaining of crushing substernal chest pain, radiating discomfort to the jaw and left arm, nausea, diaphoresis, and pallor. The diagnostic quality EKG shows ST elevation in two contiguous leads. You treat and transport in accordance with the protocols. During your consultation, the ED physician requests that you bypass the ED upon arrival and you take the patient directly to the cath lab. Is this an acceptable order according to the 2021 STEMI protocol? Because of the suspected MI and the unstable nature of the patient, this patient must be seen in the ED before being transferred to the cath lab by ED staff. In accordance with the 2021 STEMI protocol, upon arrival at the hospital, you bypass the ED and take the patient directly to the cardiac cath lab. That's right. The ED physician's instructions to take the patient directly to the cath lab are in line with the 2021 STEMI protocol. 